We're going to shift gears here certainly a bit um, from the more biological and medical side that Dr. Walker took us through so brilliantly there and look at some of the psychosocial uh, and boarding into existential or spiritual sides of um, living with cancer. And again, we'll try and touch on the impact on both patients and family members uh, and the impact on what we call informal caregivers as well. Um, so this talk will um, kind of be more general about cancer in general, though some of the more specifics will be um, definitely tied to melanoma, though in general, a lot, much of the psychology and the social impact um, of, of, uh, of melanoma can be extended more broadly to, to cancers in general. So we'll start out by just talking about some of the psychosocial impact um, of melanoma on patients and loved ones, and we'll look at some of the, the impact there uh, clinically and psychologically. Um, from there, we'll go to the, some of the trajectories of what one might expect in terms of recovery and development that actually can be um, fomented on account of an experience with cancer, uh, and some of the facets of well-being and how we can move towards that. Um, we'll look at the path through loss and suffering and what that looks like to try and come out uh, the other end, the other side. And finally, we'll talk about existential awareness and meaningful living that are also part of this broader picture. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, a little bit about the Cross Cancer Institute and the Department of Psychosocial and Spiritual Resources uh, for the, those of you who may be interested in um, speaking with one of our members. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. And then hopefully, we'll have some time for, for questions, that kind of thing. Um, so to start out, um, of course, there is a very large and sizable impact um, on our psychosocial functioning that is incurred through an incidence of melanoma or another cancer. Uh, and this, this goes for, again, both patients and their loved ones. We often describe uh, a cancer uh, diagnosis as, as a family event or as a family occurrence that many, many people are involved in this. So of course, there can be changes in one's body image. One's perception of self often changes. Roles and relationships may change. Um, career opportunities, finances, uh, the trajectory through the future can often be changed and impacted. We see there can be damaged fertility and sexual functioning on account of the treatments that are sometimes necessary. Uh, lifestyle and activities, again, these can all be impacted, which leads to, in many cases, um, changes in self-esteem and then ultimately one's sense of self or one's sense of identity. And so this kind of really gets to the core of what we understand about psychology is our sense of self, our sense of who we are, of what's meaningful, of what life is all about. And so all of these things can be shaken and disturbed um, by a cancer diagnosis. So psychological distress that, uh, that come, comes out of these different changes and disruptions. So we know that um, roughly 30%, and that's probably on the low end, but that's what our statistics show, roughly 30% of individuals with melanoma will experience a level of psychological distress or disturbance that is indicative of um, a clinical disorder. So at, at the level where we're actually saying that this individual meets criteria for a diagnosable disorder. When you're looking at subclinical levels of distress, it's much higher. It's, it's, a great majority, 60, 70 percent of individuals are experienced some, some modicum of distress on account of their experience with melanoma. So again, family members, loved ones are all, always involved, are almost always involved, and we know that the rates of distress amongst family members are um, just as high, if not higher, in many studies. Um, so some of the impacts we see is first there's the shock, this emotional numbness that comes very soon after the diagnosis and can persist for many months. Uh, anxiety, fears of occurrence. Um, this can lead into existential anxiety and fears of mortality and those kinds of questions. Anger, resentment, uh, feelings of guilt. We also experience survivor guilt and some, or some individuals experience survivor guilt. Grief and depression. And grief is not only experienced um, due to, to the loss of someone through, through death, but also through the loss of an area of functioning in general. We can experience grief, which may um, develop into more of a de depressive condition or a depressive disorder. Uh, and then also large distress due to bodily changes that may be incurred on account of the surgery itself that some individuals, um, some individuals face, that kind of thing, scarring, uh, those kind of changes to one's perception. And then post-traumatic stress disorder as well. Um, so we do know that post-traumatic stress uh, it probably has incidence of around 15 to 25 percent of individuals broadly with cancer will experience diagnosable PTSD. Uh, the subclinical rates of, of post-traumatic stress symptoms are again much, much higher. 
Uh, and so again, these, these disturbances often develop um, immediately after diagnosis. Oftentimes this shock and uh, emotional numbness will set in um, and it can persist uh, for many months through treatment, certainly, uh, and then for many individuals that move into survivorship for, for many, many years, there can be a psychological and um, social disturbances. So it's, it's certainly very, very serious for many individuals uh, and there can be ripples throughout many facets of life as we see um, oh, the wrong way. So just to speak a little bit about informal caregivers as well as they're just described in the scientific literature. Um, so these are individuals that are not trained to be a nurse or a professional staff, um, but have a role where they're actually providing care, very often in the physical sense, to a patient. So very often loved ones, spouses of some form, they're taking on this role as an informal caregiver. And we do know that for comprehensive um, psychosocial oncology care that we have to be looking at patients, caregivers, and, and loved ones just broadly. So, so everyone that's impacted um, should be receiving service and so we do know that with this population of those that take on this informal caregiver mantle that they're very often adversely impacted. There's, there's a lot of burnout, there's a lot of caregiver fatigue, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, poor immune functioning, sleep disturbances, and ultimately a lot of individuals describe this impact um, on their ability to have a partner in the same way, that there's often this change where there used to be a relationship in a different dynamic that now switches to more of a caregiver role, so that can also precipitate big shifts. So we also see that um, leading to many, many disturbances in one's psychological uh, and social well-being and functioning. So that kind of just gives us, I think, a little bit of a, a snapshot of, of some of the ways in which um, patients, again, and loved ones can be, can be impacted, some of the ramifications. So, so one of the ways in which cancer is, um, is described and kind of conceptualized in literature as, as a life transition. We're kind of going along in our life and then all of a sudden there's this big event and then everything seems to be disrupted and changed. And kind of as we transition from say adolescence into adulthood or as we retire or that kind of thing, those are considered normative life transitions. And this may be considered a non-normative or an atypical life transition, though, of course, what the statistics show is that it's all, all, all too common. But nonetheless, it's the kind of transitional event um, that can lead to this disruption and we enter the state what we describe as moratorium. And moratorium is a state where we again reevaluate who we are, the meaning of our life, what our priorities are, what our values are, and those kinds of things. So we can be a real disarray, and yet at the same time, there's actually a lot of opportunity um, that is incurred, and I believe that's the term f um, that uh, the, the term crisis means danger and opportunity, I believe is what uh, one of the symbolic representations. And so that's, that's actually what we're gonna see is one of the silver linings that's possible here. And so we do know that from this crisis situation, from this life event situation, there are roughly three trajectories. And one of them is that we can, we can spiral downward and develop a kind of clinical disorder of one form or another. And that's if we kind of descend and if we don't have the supports that we might need or require. Um, for many individuals, they recover to their baseline functioning and they continue on with their life. And yet for some individuals, we know that they actually feel that they grow or they actually develop as a person, psychologically, existentially, spiritually, they describe, on account of going through this crisis. Again, for patients and family members alike. And there's a whole burgeoning area of literature that's called uh, post-traumatic growth or stress-related growth that we're now showing more and more individuals. And this is actually a very big area in the psychosocial oncology literature that's showing many individuals feel that they come out of their cancer experience with a different level of wisdom or self-insight or these kind of things. So the question is, is how can we help individuals then through this crisis, through this moratorium and come out the other end either at baseline or perhaps feeling that they've kind of developed some, some way in their life. And so these are some of the major areas that people feel as though that they may have changed. Um, a deepened appreciation of their interpersonal relationships, um, an appreciation of life that's changed, an increased sense of personal strength or resiliency, a psychological or spiritual growth or changes in that domain, uh, and changes in ultimately life direction, priorities, and values. <clears throat> 
So some of the major facets then that either contribute to or are part of coming out on the other end with what we call eudaimonic well-being, so which is not just happiness, but also this sense of flourishing in life. So we know that we have to look at a biopsychosocial existential model. So we have to look across the board. So biological is, of course, our physical being. We want health on that level. Psychological, our mind, our emotions. Social, interpersonally, and existential or spiritual at the kind of the, the realm of meaning and the highest questions that humans pose for, for why we're here, what the point of this is all about. So biological, of course, we know the literature um, shows very clearly that exercise is, is very important, of course, for our physical well-being. Also, this contributes to our psychological well-being. Um, the effect sizes for exercise are actually higher to antidepressant medications, so it's very, very powerful. Um, healthy diet, of course, same thing. I think Hippocrates um, once said, let food be thy medicine, so that again speaks to that. Sleep, of course, the literature on this is, is growing all the time. There's a great scientist at uh, Berkeley um, named Matthew Walker, I believe. Uh, he studies sleep and its implications. It's very, very interesting. So we're, if we're looking at its impact on um, immune functioning is just staggering, um, and rest and relaxation in general. Then if we move over to the psychological realm, mindfulness, this is kind of a buzzword now, which is trying to foster a condition of non-judgmental openness and curiosity to experience rather than resisting or challenging our experience as such. It's being with and being present with experience, and this has a whole host of literature behind it as well. Creativity, play, and flow states are really trying to engage not just the rational intellect, but the deeper parts of our mind and our psyche to engage with essentially more of a kind of child, childhood way of being. We know there's lots of benefits to this. Um, trying to foster certain positive states, awe, self-compassion, gratitude. There's much literature on this, the well-being that we call the broaden and build. This is uh, very, very important, again, for our well-being psychologically. And then fostering dialectical thought and flexibility. Dialectical thought means um, black and white do not exist. They both exist together, or everything is gray. So trying to see A and B. Um, a, a, great, a great strategy that you can use to really try to develop dialectical thinking is to stop using the word but and use the word and instead. So it's not this but that. It's this and that. And almost all situations involve that. And that's real dialectical thought. And that's also incurred through mindfulness. So we move to the social level. So we know that relationships, we're social beings, we're social animals. Um, and again, the research on this shows that social support is very, very important. The literature on social support, we'll talk about a little bit later, again, shows this is one of the most pre important predictive variables for determining uh, psychological adjustment um, following diagnosis of cancer, of, of, of any stripe. Um, healthy boundaries, this is one thing that many patients and family members struggle with, is this assertiveness to say no, to not take on more than we, than we can. And many, many individuals um, do struggle with this, to say no, to say, no, I can't take that on. And yet we do know that we have to do that, to take care of ourselves. We, we like to say that you can't pour an empty cup. So particularly for the caregivers, you know, you can't give if there's nothing to give. And so we, have, we always have to take time to, to rest and recharge so that we can be social. Relational intimacy, which is having meaningful interpersonal contact with other individuals. Uh, again, we know that this is very important for fostering a context for empathy and for sharing our deepest sorrows or fears and jubilations and joys as well. And then sexual health is often can be impacted by cancer. And so everyone differs on this level, but we do know that this is an important piece and we have a program for that as well at the cross. And then finally, we have the existential dimension, the spiritual dimension, or religious dimension, if you prefer any of those terms. So they all kind of get at the same point, which is this, this kind of highest level of our thinking, of who we are and what we are about. So taking time for self-reflection, meditation or prayer, exploring our values, priorities, and really trying to be authentic in our pursuit of a meaningful life. And so all of these kind of go together. Uh, towards the development of well-being, and they can all, to one degree or another, be impacted by cancer. And so they're all facets that if we can work to try and combine these, this will take us on that trajectory to, to growth and well-being um, out of the state of, of disarray that we may have been placed in. So, um, so we'll look a little bit now at the path then out, out of suffering, uh, out of loss, and through to the other side. Um, so when we look at loss and suffering, we know that any life transition, regardless of whether or not it's desired or not, 
involves a change. And we know that for humans, we simultaneously want change and we don't want change at the same time. So again, it's kind of one of these paradoxes. We want novelty, we want something new, and yet we don't want something new. And so when cancer is foisted upon us, it's typically not by choice, and we certainly typically don't want it either. Um, and so this, this change comes, and boom, we're now put into a new state. And we experience some sense of loss, a loss of a previous life condition, a loss of a previous sense of what our future might look like. All these different kind of things can be changed. And so we experience this as loss. And we feel that suffering comes as a function of loss. It's different than pain. Pain is a different phenomena. Suffering is different. and They do not necessarily go hand in hand. So suffering is believed to be incurred upon the experience of loss. And so again, as I mentioned earlier, this loss could be due to physical or bodily capacity of some form, due to your, one's social roles or the relationships may now change, uh, one's vocation or financial trajectory, and one's sense of time or anticipated future may now have been changed. There might be a sense of loss here as well. So in all of these changes that we might experience, we can experience a sense of loss and therefore a sense of suffering. So this distress that we develop, distressing thoughts and emotions and memories and certain things start to run through our mind, these internal monologues that we develop or painful emotional states that arise, this is essentially the mind's way of reacting against and revolting against this change, against something that it doesn't want, something that it wishes that it was not present. And so that makes sense, that's understandable. However, we do know that avoiding over the long term these kinds of thoughts and emotions, if we do not face them, if we don't look at them, they can develop more and more severe manifestations and they can develop into psychosomatic type symptoms. We can experience pain or tension in our body um, or psych more psychological symptoms. Panic attacks start to become more common, sense of depression, malaise, um, the sense of not having any mo motivation, all of these different kinds of, um, of um, uh, symptomatic expressions can be incurred when we're not facing some element of our, of our experience, of, of our reality as it's, been, as it's been changed. So, okay, so then, then what do we do about that? Well, there's this dual process model that seemed to be suggested on the path to recovery. And so what this looks like, again, is kind of this dialectic that on the one hand, we have what's called the loss orientation. And the loss orientation means being with, processing, experiencing our sadness, the loss, the sorrow, whatever emotions may be involved with the loss, with the change, what we must let go of and say goodbye to. And then on the other hand, there's what's called the restoration pool or the restoration orientation, which is saying, okay, now what? How do I rebuild the sense of meaning? How do I rebuild my identity in the face of this change? And so we vacillate between the two of these. It's letting go of our old state, of our old normal, and creating a new normal. And the patients that I work with often say, I'm trying to find my new normal, or I'm, I'm lost, I don't know who I am anymore. These are really, really common phenomenological descriptors of what individuals often face as they go through. So it's how do we let go of that old state that we might not want to or might not be ready to let go of, and how do we build, how do we find this new sense of normal stability? So it's a big piece of this is this acknowledgement or this acceptance of what can't be changed. And that's the, a big, big difficulty. There's a, an entire model of psychotherapy called acceptance and commitment therapy. And we actually run a group um, in our department on that. It's, it's very, very useful for working towards that. It incorporates principles of mindfulness. And uh, it's, a, it's a stripe of cognitive behavioral therapy that's, uh, that's uh, coming into use that helps us to, to do this, to, to move through this, to acknowledge. And when we accept, when we open, when we surrender what we cannot change and what we were and what we once hoped and dreamed, we now have this opportunity for creativity. So again, many patients also describe this sense of almost excitement, this tentative excitement of what is now possible. Who, who can I be? There's this, this, this little budding sense of how can I make my life anew through this? And so, how do we do this? We cope. So coping strategies and techniques can help us through both of these two poles. So to introduce more complexity to the loss orientation and to the restoration orientation, we also have active coping and we have avoidance coping. And so active coping is, as the name implies, actively exploring one's emotions, actively reflecting, or perhaps coming to see a psychologist and working through those kind of things. 
So we're actively going out, we're actively pursuing new activities that we can enjoy, we're actively socializing or whatever it might be. We're really taking that active stance to rebuilding our life or to exploring our loss, but we're active in it. And then the other side is avoidance. And avoidance is sometimes also described as this term denial in psychoanalytic psychology. And we might think of that as a bad word, but we know the literature is very clear that avoidance is not bad. It's not all bad, that in certain times we don't need to be looking full bore at our experience and what's happening, what's changing. Sometimes we need to be doing other things. And so again, we need to vacillate between the two. There's a time for actively coping and actively addressing, and there's a time for avoiding our experience as well. We do know that in the long term, avoidance does become a problem if we never look at and address our experience as it is and how it may have changed. But we do know that there's a time and place for that, like, like most things in psychology. There's a time and place for most things. So again, when we, when we balance the two of these, this, this loss, restoration, and actively or avoiding our experience together in tandem, we slowly move through to the other side. So compassion and social support, these, these are integral to this process as well. Um, so we do know that support of others in our lives, whether they're professionals um, or, or other individuals, do provide the supportive context for us to explore our thoughts and our emotions and to process them, to get them off our chest, so to speak, or as we say, to unburden ourselves. Uh, and, and also to support us through a crisis, through uh, this development. Uh, one thing that I think is worth pointing out is that although positive encouragement is often appreciated for what it is, it can also become um, kind of uh, a burden placed on individuals to stay positive when maybe they need to explore their despair as well. Um, and a famous existential psychologist named Rollo May famously said that, that hope derives from despair, that true freedom comes from despair. And so we need to allow ourselves to have our darkest sorrows as well. So again, the positive side matters, and so does the darkness as well. Again, that's back to that dialectical thought that we should not, should not um, be a fright, frightened of exploring this as well, because that's where, as we'll see, meaningful living truly comes from. Um, so suffering with is, is, is what compassion literally means, to suffer with. And that's, I believe that's the Latin etymology of the term of compassion, is to suffer with. And so that's what it means to have compassion for another to be with, and this is empathy, to enter into someone's space and to be with them in their experience as it is. It's different than sympathy. Sympathy is, is again, appreciated, but doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. We need empathy. Empathy is true understanding of whatever one's mental state might, might look like. And so this also applies to ourselves. Self-compassion is also very important. To suffer with oneself, to allow oneself to have one's suffering, to say that it's okay that I have this. And again, that opens, up, uh, opens us up to new vistas, to exploring our existential condition. So by confronting our existential state, and that may be despair, sore, that can be awe and jubilation as well that can come out of this. This, this appreciation or what Abraham Maslow called peak experiences can also come out of this profound encounter with our despair. These peaks and these veils that go together, again, the dialectic, the black and the white together. By confronting our existential condition head on, it clarifies our values and our priorities and what really matters. And again, I've had a lot, many patients describe it as shedding an, uh, or peeling an onion, that they've been shedding inauthentic layers of who they were and of a life that they'd never thought in some way may not have been truly what they wanted to do or embrace. And so now they feel that they may have been released from that by truly encountering their life in, a, in, a, in the most stark of ways. And so cancer, forces us into that situation much of the time, to look and to encounter that reality. So our values are not goals, they're different. They function as a, as a compass to kind of orient us to goals and to behaviors and actions that are meaningful. And, and for many individuals, this means connecting with something greater than oneself. And this is what's described as self-transcendence in the literature. The sense of purpose and connection by actively contributing or feeling a sense of oneness with something much bigger. And so for many of us, that means spirituality. And the research is very, very clear that spirituality is very, very important, has a very protective fact, uh, function for many individuals experiencing all sorts of different kinds of distress, particularly cancer is, is amongst them. 
Um, and it's associated with well-being, resilience, higher immune function, you name it. It, it has positive associations and, and predictions associated with it. I also think it's very, very important, though, that we point out that spirituality is, is not the same as religion. Spirituality and religion are actually two independent constructs. So you can actually be very religious and not spiritual at all. And you can be very spiritual and not at all religious. And I think that's very important to point out. You can be completely secular and spiritual. So that this is, this is a human attribute that's open to all of us. And um, so that, that's, I think, very important to clarify, that we all have this capacity for some sense of communion with something that we feel is, is much larger than our individual personal life, to give us a sense of strength and meaning and purpose to, to carry on. So lastly, uh, as I mentioned, all individuals um, that are, that are um, impacted by cancer, family members and whatnot, should be um, given the opportunity to speak with professionals. Again, a supportive context, social uh, support is always, is always useful. But at the same time, as I pointed out earlier, that informal caregivers very often just do not have the skill set and are often in need of support themselves and so can't provide the professional services. And so these services are offered through our department to all patients with cancer and to their family members. And that's regardless of whether or not they meet criteria for a psychological disorder. I think that's really important to emphasize as well that psychosocial oncology is not psychiatry. They're very, very different. There are certainly some individuals with psychiatric issues that that develop cancer, of course that is true. But most individuals that we see at the cross do not have a psychiatric disorder. And so I think oftentimes with patients, I do have to explain to them that you know, this, this is a different context, that, that most people experiencing um, uh, cancer in, in their life or a family member's life are gonna experience some distress. And so that, that should not make them shy away from speaking with the professional. Um, the research again shows that counseling and psychotherapy interventions are very, very effective in these populations. Uh, very often I will work with individuals for one, two, or three sessions, and that's all they really feel as though they need to kind of get their bearings um, back in place. And for others it may, may take longer, and that's okay as well. But the services are there, and again, they are um, part of Alberta Health Services, so they are covered. You don't have to pay for these services. Um, so at the, at the Cross, we do have psychologists, we have social workers, and we also have spiritual care counselors, non-denominational spiritual care counselors as well. Um, and, and finally, there is our number. You can certainly speak with me if you're interested uh, in looking at, um, at, at what we have um, available. Um, so yeah, I guess, I suppose that's it. Um, Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, so we do know that certainly um, counseling interventions are appropriate across uh, the trajectory. So for individuals that may be going into palliative care as well, um, there definitely uh, is effective service there too. So it's not just for individuals that may be in the midst of treatment um, or now into survivorship and that kind of thing, uh, but it's also for individuals where the treatment has, has not worked or that they, they now have, have moved into more of a palliative status. That certainly there's also the end of life care that we're involved with and the spiritual care counselors are involved with. And we have a, um, a close working relationship with the Gray Nuns Hospital who has a, a palliative division there um, as well. So certainly the, the interventions go across the spectrum um, uh, for, for essentially regardless of what one's particular trajectory might be with, with cancer. But yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. No, you don't. You just need essentially our phone number, which I'll put back up. Uh, and if you give us a call, um, yeah, we will, we will um, hook you up with one of our, our psychologists or whoever might be appropriate. And we can certainly speak with that on a, on a first intake that we do over the phone to kind of determine whether or not our services are the appropriate fit. And if not, we'd put you in contact potentially with community services. But um, no, you do not need a referral uh, from a physician to access our services. That's a great question. It's another way in which we're different than the mental health umbrella is that we're, um, we're in, the, in cancer control.
Yeah, certainly Wellspring has some great programming over there as well. Wellspring is uh, a not-for-profit, and it's run by volunteers and other individuals, other patients um, themselves and family members. Though my understanding is that Wellspring doesn't have much professionally-led programming, so they have more kind of peer-led groups, that which many individuals actually prefer. However, we do have professional like, like uh, group therapy groups um, uh, at the cross as well, uh, a variety. We have, again, spiritual care type groups. We have our um, acceptance and commitment therapy group. There's an advanced cancer group um, that, that focuses more on the kind of existential side of things, of mortality and whatnot. So there's, there's uh, yeah, a variety of different things that we run, stress management, that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I, that's, that's a good question. So individuals, we do some couples work. We do not do families work or family work, um, which is like big family therapy. Um, that's, that, that's a whole different kind of area. Um, and yeah, we, do, we currently don't have an art therapy program. We used to. Um, we're, we're trying to get funding back for that, but a lot of individuals have benefited from that. Uh, thank you again um, for, for having me, um, and uh, yeah, good evening. Thank you.